Welcome to NBA Today. I'm Malika Andrews. We have so much to unpack in this show, including a 50-point night from the Finals MVP and a game winner to cap a career night from one of the hottest players in the league right now. But we have to start with the heavyweight bouts between the top four teams in the East, and we need to start that with the shorthanding Celtics. They went for their eighth season high straight victory win over the ATL. Some headlines from that one. Jalen Brown scored 22 points and Boston got a 126-101 victory, by the way. They're the first team to 12 wins this season. Seven players scored double figures. They made 21 threes. That's nothing new for Boston, though, right? It was the third time this season they've made 20 or more threes in a game. So I want to bring in our friend Vince Carter, an analyst for us NBA folks on ESPN. Vince, what did you make of this one? A very confident Boston Celtics team, Lika. Five guys who average at least three assists or more. They bought into the idea of if we play team ball, we play together, we share it, and let the ball find the open player, we can win games. And then we'll defend. I mean, you look at Jason Tatum, who's averaging four assists, Jalen Brown averaging three assists, and Marcus Smart, who's averaging seven assists. That just sets the tone for how they want to play offensively. I mean, they're they're averaging 120 points per game. That is a confident team, and you can tell what the goal is. They want to get back to the to the uh, NBA Finals and, mm. and finish the job this year. They are playing just like that, as well as their uh, MVP nominee, Jason Tatum. Vince Carter, thank you so much. Please do not go too far, my friend. All right, let's get to another big game in the Eastern Conference. It was between two teams that boasted stars averaging 30-plus points per game. You can see them, Donovan Mitchell, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Both teams, though, looking to shake the losing streaks. They were on the Bucks. They were shorthanded. No Drew Holiday, no Chris Middleton, no Pat Connaughton in this one. Giannis scored a season-low 16 points, but still, the Bucks they beat the Cavs 113-98, handing the Cavs their fifth consecutive loss. Brooke Lopez, he showed out against his brother. He and Jordan Nora scored to combine 50 points, hit 12 of Milwaukee's 16 threes in the win. Donovan Mitchell had his eighth straight 20-point game. So let's bring in our friend Kendrick Perkins on this one. Perk, was this game more about the Cavs or Milwaukee? It was more about the Cavs. We already know what we're going to get out of Milwaukee and Giannis Antetokounmpo, especially when they play at at home. But Let's talk about the new kid on the block, and that's the Cleveland Cavaliers, Hmm. right? A lot of praise since acquiring Donovan Mitchell. We have a lot of praise for Evan Mobley, a lot of praise for Darius Garland, and this team is too good to be on a five-game losing streak right now. And when you look at their team, yes, they're going to fill up the box scores. That could be fool's goal at times. The Cavs have to find a way to start doing the little things that don't show up in the stat sheet, the little things like getting back in transition, the little things like sinking and filling, helping out one another on the defensive end, tied together like a string for us rotation-wise, and you're not seeing that. We're not seeing active hands and deflections. And until they figure those things out, until they can put other things aside and don't worry about the box score, but worry about what's going to help them win, like diving on the floor, they're going to continue to struggle. And it's unacceptable because they have, they have one of the most talented rosters in the NBA. Mm, Perk, thank you very much. Please do not go too far. All right, so to recap, top two seeds in the East, they took care of business on the road. But where does that leave their power rankings? For that, I want to turn to ESPN senior writer Zach Lowe. We're, We're a month into the season. The top four spots, power rankings in the East, if you will, How are you diagnosing this? Well, three and four are really, really hard. And you're not going to fool me by putting two Hawks logos there. (laughs) And maybe we need to turn this logo into like a sad face or something instead of the Nets logo. Oh, Zach. I'm grandfathering in, even though they have not played well. Their offense looks sloggy and Joel Embiid has to do everything. I'm grandfathering in the Sixers just on pure talent. I know they're 500. They deserve to be here. Anyone else at three? I mean, just kind of pick who you like. It's like Baskin Robbins. Pick whatever flavor you want. But I'm going Cleveland. On a five-game losing streak, because I just think the ceiling they've shown Hmm. when their four best players are healthy is a little higher than what Atlanta has shown. I'm sorry, Atlanta, and your two logos. You got shellac last night. You're out. But look, the bottom line is, between here and here, there is a gigantic gulf. These two teams. Separate these. Yeah, they should be over here somewhere. These two teams have been the best teams in the league. And look, you can pick either one for number one. I picked Milwaukee to win the title. They've done this without Chris Middleton, yes. Pat Connaughton, Drew Holiday lately. So I'm going to have to cringe a little bit, put Boston 2 and Milwaukee 1. Milwaukee, come on, Bucks. There you go. Milwaukee 1. Just because just I picked them to win a tie, I got to stick to it. But those two teams, 
they are looking not just head and shoulders, like the whole upper body right. above everybody else. I don't think you can be mad putting the Bucks one, Celtics two. They may flip flop and continue to throughout the rest of the regular season, but I, I hope we get to see that matchup in the Eastern Conference Finals. Some of these teams don't hope that though. Uh, uh, Miami's gonna Miami's gonna this have stuff what, to say. Toronto, everyone's gonna have stuff to say. And and the Hawks with their two logos. All right, so that's the top of the East. Let, let's switch gears though to the West and the defending champion Golden State Warriors here, because in case you missed it last night, Steph Curry he. El Fuego on fire, scoring 50 points. He was continuing the offensive tear he's been on. Had 31 in the first half alone. It, it just wasn't enough for the Warriors in the Valley against the Suns. It's the 11th time he's had 50 in his career, but it was only the third time that the Warriors have lost when he's reached that mark. The Warriors fell to 6-9 and nine for the season, 0-8 oh on the road. So take a listen to Steve Kerr after the game. We've got to we got every, get everybody on, on board, on board. You know, on, the, on the same page in terms of just worrying about winning, and that's it. And I think, um, for, you know, for right now anyway, I think we're just scattered. We're, it's a pickup game. Uh, there's no, uh, no execution at either end, no, no sort of uh, commitment to the group. I saw a lot of hanging heads tonight. I think we're feeling sorry for ourselves, and um, nobody's going to feel sorry for us. Um, so uh, everyone can't wait to play us and kick our ass. So the Warriors, they've been the worst team on the road this season. They're allowing more than 124 points per game away from Chase Center, by far the most by any team this season. That's almost 13 more points than when it, what they allow at home. So I want to bring in everybody here, welcoming in Brian Windhorst to the conversation. There's just a ton to dig into. But, Perk, I want to start with you. When you are looking at the Warriors, what is most concerning to you when they are on the road? You know what? <laughs> I sit on here time and time again, and I come on here preaching. I preach about body language. I preach about just looking at guys' actions, the feeling, the camaraderie. And we saw that last night out of the Golden State Warriors. This is the team that actually won the NBA championship last year. They don't have chemistry. The chemistry is gone right now. Now, will they get it back? I don't know, but right now it's not there. If you look at them across the board and watch how they're playing, they're playing a whole bunch of individual basketball. It's not a team anymore. Mm -hmm. It's guys playing with hidden agendas. It was yet, uh, late in the, second, uh, yet in the second half last night. I watched Klay Thompson pull up for two bad shots on, on the other end. If you'd have watched the body language of Draymond Green, along with the body language of Jordan Poole, they're having these problems. And then all of a sudden, you see Jordan Poole and, and, and uh, Andrew Wiggins, they get paid. All of a sudden, they feel like they need a bigger role. But check these two plays out right here. That's one. Clay pull up again. Look at Draymond under the basket. He don't even get back on defense. He's not even interested. Look, he's hanging his head. Steve Kerr pointed it out. He know that he have issues in the locker room. And again, I said this before, when the incident happened with Draymond Green and Jordan Poole, that this is going to be one of the biggest challenges in Steve Kerr's coaching career as the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. And here we are. Brian, I know, uh -huh. I know you were looking at Jordan Poole as well. What stood out to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening very closely what Steve Kerr is saying, and I'm taking under advisement what Perk is just mentioning there. And I do think that there's something there. I think a team that is famous for its chemistry definitely has issues to work through. But the reason that they're struggling with, with you know, surviving Jordan Poole having poor shooting, because the thing about it is, you know, he shot the ball really well in the preseason when he got that contract and when he had the whole punch issue. I think he could just be in a slump. And the reason that they're having a bigger problem dealing with the Jordan Poole slump and dealing with the Clay Thompson down shooting time is because of that defensive, those defensive numbers you showed, Malika. They are not used to being a bottom four defensive team. They're 27th right now. And when you are a bad defensive team, it makes everything harder. It makes going on the road harder. It makes, uh, you know, bad shooting stretches harder. It makes a weaker bench harder. When you can't get stops, it eliminates your margin for error. And the Warriors have been famous for a huge margin for error. And so if they could just start defending better, and that might take a transaction to help their bench, I think a lot of things would improve, potentially including the attitudes in the locker room. Well, and we talk about defensive efficiency. When you say 27th, that's after being second in the league last year, Zach. It's 
it's a, a drop off the likes of which I can never I can never recall. And and this is the whole thing. You can't win road home on Mars. It doesn't matter if you're. <laughs>